By PC Pod or Pad, you're listening to Paid to Play. My name is Rob Farker and I am your host for this weekly exploration of the dangerous idea that bringing your whole self, especially the bits that you worry make you seem silly, geeky or odd, into your income generating life is the best thing you can do. It might not be easy, but it's easier than we think and even fear, and I want to show you how. Every fortnight, I chat with someone who has taken the things he, she, or they loves to do, recognised that other people value the products or skills of that play, and then stood by that value and asked for, and received, financial reward. Now, normally when I record these podcasts, I will ask my guests at the end of the show where they can be found online, but... If you've never heard of Zoo Studios before, I would like to ask you for a quick favour. Uh, pause this recording very quickly if you want to. Fire up your web browser and go to Zoo Studios' website, which is Zulu Oscar Oscar Sierra Tango Uniform Delta Indigo Oscar.com.au and take a look. I know, right? Isn't it incredible? All those wonderful, fantastic pictures of people's pets that they've done. It's, you can see why I wanted to get these folks on the podcast, can't you? Well, let me tell you just a little bit more about them before I get into chatting with them proper. Ken and Beck Drake have set, been running Zoo Studio, which specializes exclusively in pet portraiture since 2007. So that must be a good eight years now. Uh, Ken... And Beck both love animals and they have a passion for animal welfare. Ken is all about capturing their personalities, their stories and their emotions in those wonderful photographic portraits that you just saw. Now, Beck handles the sales and marketing and making sure that the stories of Zoo Studios get shared with their clients and the stories of their clients themselves about the love they have for their pets are shared properly. Uh, I could not imagine a better way for them to embrace their passions for animals and the way we all love our pets and make us all feel that little bit more wonderful about that special relationship that we have. Beck and Ken, thank you both very much for coming on the Pay to Play podcast. You're welcome, Rob, and thanks for the wonderful introduction. <laughs> We're happy to be here. You're most welcome. So uh, you started Zoo Studios off in 2007. Uh, would you mind telling me a little bit what you both were doing beforehand? I was uh, working in IT, uh, in software in particular, in London. And um, just in 2006, uh, we moved over to Perth in Western Australia and... Um, that's when I started thinking, oh, I need to do other things. Like, what were you up to? Well, I was in IT too, Rob. <laughs> so we both come from a corporate background. Um, and I also was in sales and marketing and I managed a lot of uh, global alliance partnerships for some major US companies. So we've both come from a, from a techie background, but mine's like more so business. Mm. So, Ken, uh, at what point, how long have you been playing with photography? Was it a recent thing that you sort of picked up just before Zoo Studio started, or had it been going on for a while? Well, I've, I've really picked it up just before Zoo Studio started. I've been um, really keen on photography as a, a young man, not so much as a kid, but as a young man. I think I picked it up from my father, who always had a camera with him. and um, uh, But I, I never really had a chance to focus on it and uh, get good at it and um, I've been working in software for, for 18 years and uh, I left the company I've been working for and just you know felt like I needed to take a break I had a few months and I'd, my initial plan was to go traveling but I'd met Beth by this point and uh, I didn't want to really leave her as a single lady in London because I didn't know if, I'd, if she'd still be around when I got back <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd better hang around here so I thought alright what am I going to do I need, need some time off to reset my brain um, so uh, I went and I thought, oh no, I'll revisit photography. I haven't picked up a camera in a few years. Um, and uh, digital cameras were just really starting to become mainstream at that point. So well, I got my first digital SLR camera. And um, also at the same time, because I'd stopped traveling, um, Beck said, right, we can get cats. So we, we, got a, we got a couple of cats, Willie and Lucy. Yeah, and um, yeah, we're beautiful man coon cats. And uh, um, I got the camera, and uh, about the same time we got the cat, so it was naturally for me to, to start capturing them. And um, I just remember 
and with time to dedicate to both um, the photography and, and the cats, then uh, I just found that I soon became addicted to just taking photos of them, but in particular capturing their personalities. It wasn't about how beautiful they are, and they're both beautiful cats. It was all about capturing their very distinct personalities. Mm. And uh, that's where I started to get hooked on the animal photography. Oh, fantastic. Um, I almost hate to take a break from that topic, but uh, uh, I did want to ask, Beck, from the sounds of things, sales and marketing has kind of been your through line in your story. Uh, Is it, you know, uh, from the sounds of it, it is a passion of yours, but uh, uh, how did you find that particular um, angle for your working life? Um, I think it started when I was a child, to be honest, Rob. Mm-hmm. My father was a policeman and I spent my whole life and my well, my whole child, childhood and my teenage life travelling around the world. So we lived in various different parts of New Zealand. We lived in England for a while. We lived in Papua New Guinea, both in Rabaul, East New Brit- Britain province, and also Port Moresby. And I think... That really opened my eyes up to the world, but also opened my eyes up to different people and different cultures. So I've always been someone that can, you know, step into a crowd and feel comfortable with strangers and get to know them and and listen to their stories and appreciate their stories from all walks of life. So it was kind of a natural thing for me to fall into something that involved, at the end of the day, um, talking and working with people. And when my father went back to Papua New Guinea for a third contract, I was then a very young adult and I was in Sydney at the time and I happened to, I wanted to be an accountant. (laughs) I don't know why. I wanted to be an accountant when I first started. I think it was because I was going to go to uni and I was going to become an accountant. But I I started in an IT company called Annabelle Bits. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Annabelle Bits. It was called Annabelle Bits, and Annabelle was the the wife's name of the husband that ran the business. And I started an account um, working for a lovely South African lady. And after about a year and a half of doing accounts payable and debt collection, I realised I was way too extroverted <laughs> to be behind <laughs> a, com- a computer. I think they were. XTs and 286s at that time. Oh, the good old days. Really, really early days. And um, so they put me into purchasing and managing the purchasing division. So that got me talking to people in Taiwan and America and China. Um, And then it was sort of natural progression to head up their um, new office in Canberra and look after Department of Defense and government contracts. So it just kind of fell into me because of my personality, I guess. Um, And I was really good at it. And it was more about the fact that I was really focused on serving the client and serving the interests of the client and that's how I've always worked basically. Fantastic. So um, uh, winding the uh, clock forward again, so you two had moved out to Perth and uh, your two main coons, did you uh, did you get those in the UK? Did they come out with you? Yes, they're British British loyalty royalty. Ah, (laughs) fantastic. All fellow prisoners of Mother England. <laughs> so, so were we, Ken and I. Yeah. But, um, you know, we, we flew them over to. We, we were we were never going to get them unless we knew that we could um, bring them to Australia with us. Mm. So um, the quarantine rules had relaxed before we got um, Willie and Lucy. So it was only a thirty day quarantine. So yeah, we flew them back with us. So oh. they meow with a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> Someone to watch the cricket with as well. <laughs> uh, of course, of course. So um, I take it there. Uh, uh, we know where their loyalties lie in the current Ashes tournament. Then, yeah. <laughs> yes. well, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so you'd started taking uh, photos of them getting into it. Um, uh, when was the point that you actually kind of realised that you were onto something? I mean, did you show those photos around to people and all of a sudden they started asking, hey, could um, these look great? Could you? It's funny. It's, when, when I got to Australia, I, 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 I presumed I was going to go back into an IT role mm. and um, that's what the, the whole plan was. And, uh, you know, I'd just be keeping the photography as a hobby. 
Um, and when we got to when, when I got to Australia, and we, we arrived in Perth, and Beck had been living in Perth um, for a, quite a few years before then. So um, uh, there's a lot of people that I was meeting for the first time, but who are really good friends of Beck, and uh, they all had pets. So I was photographing their pets for them as I was looking for a job in IT, and um, um, it soon worked. Uh, it's, I soon worked out that um, uh, I, I wasn't going to get a job in IT that was nearly as much fun as the job that I've been doing in London. Um, <laughs> And um, that, that's you know no, no um, slur on Perth, but it's obviously a much 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 smaller market for software than London is. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not the sort of guy who wants to do second best, and this was kind of bothering me a little bit. And uh, I remember being at the vets one day, and um, 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 I was just talking to the vet who is um, we're just taking our dogs in for a, a checkup because the other thing I, I acquired when I got to Australia were Beck's two dogs, her golden retrievers. So I had two more <laughs> subjects to photograph. Um, and uh, I remember that um, the vet saying, "Oh, what do you do?" And um, just I don't know where it came from, but I just said, "Oh, I'm, I'm a pet photographer." And because um, it wasn't really anything at that point. And um, the, the guy said, oh, we're looking for a pet photographer. You ought to ring our marketing person. And um, so I called my market, the, the, the marketing person and she said, oh, come in next week with your portfolio. And I thought, oh, man, I've got a week to get a portfolio. <laughs> and as I was looking through my photos, I realized that I actually had a portfolio there. I, I built one up without even realizing it. Um, so I, I took it in and um, she was raving about it and uh, giving, giving me really positive feedback. So uh, that was one moment where I thought, well, you know, maybe I do have something going here. Um, and about that same sort of time, I've met um, a, a, another professional photographer in Perth because I've been on a couple of photography training courses, a guy called Dale Neal. And um, I was talking to him and I said about this idea of maybe being a pet photographer. And he said, yeah, go for it. Do it, do it, do it. There's... Uh, it, he said, one, there's definitely a market for it, which had been a big question mark in my head. But two, he said, you know, if that's your passion, then you ought to follow your passion. And he really encouraged me to do it. And he helped me and he mentored me, which was really useful in the early days. And um, so that, that's really how I came about doing it. That sounds incredible. It just seems to be one of those things uh, where you just start, you kept on doing what you're already doing in that wonderful uh, straight up <laughs> opportunity. I've always... One of the things I've been trying to do lately is ask people, you know what it's like in conversation? You meet someone new and one of the first things you ask them is that dreaded question, what do you do? And <laughs> it's always, in most cases, you're asking people to talk about one of the, the most routine and least exciting aspects of their lives. And it seems as though you de you're, you answer the question that I'm trying to ask people instead. Um, which is what do you love doing or what do you dig? And you came out with that answer anyway, instead of saying, oh yeah, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a software engineer just um, uh, looking for a, 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 a challenging job at the moment. Um, yeah, you just came out with the, with the answer to uh, the right answer to the wrong question and it all worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess the other half of the equation is that I'd um, uh, never really felt like I was particularly good in the corporate environment. And, yeah. uh, the company I've been working for had started off as a, a crazy little British software company with 10 people working there. And after 10 years, um, it had turned into an American software company with over 1,000 people. It had floated on NASDAQ and um, it had been very corporate and there was a lot of politics. And I just had yeah. this idea in the back of my mind that I, I also wanted a challenge of running my own business um, and um, uh, working for myself so I could basically not have to worry about office politics which I've been yeah. really, really, really bad at all my life. So that was the other thing that was going in, on in my mind at that point as well. Mm. So Beck, your husband comes home one day and says, hey, you know what, I think I'm going to be a pet photographer. What was your first reaction there? <laughs> I was like, awesome, how can I use him in my business? <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I actually came to the studio the indirect right, route um, because a bit like Ken, I've always, always wanted to run my own business at some stage and all throughout my life I can look back and I can go, I made a bunch of decisions that were pointing me in, and taking me in that direction. Um, the first one, one <laughs> this might sound a bit arrogant, but the first one was when I was about 13 and... We had a type, there was the school had typing classes and as a, to learn to be a typist. And, and most of the girls in my country school in New Zealand were taking the typing class. And the teacher asked me why 
don't you want to take the typing class? And I said, because I'm going to own my own business one day and I'll have people do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I hope it doesn't sound arrogant, but that's when it started. <laughs> and then I left my very busy uh, IT career for a two-year sabbatical and I, I did my MBA. I, chunk, I chunked it down into two years and did a postgraduate in marketing at the same time. And um, uh, and then I went to England to meet Ken. So when I came back from England, um, I was very clear that I was intending to set up my own business. Um, and what I did was set up a business and event management, which kind of got me into project management and sales and marketing again with a very good friend of mine. And so I was actually running an event management company at the time that Ken was running his photography studio so I was poaching all the time to do event photography <laughs> and corporate headshots and all that kind of stuff as well um, so yeah but then I guess having come to Brisbane um, I decided that that's really where my passion was because for, unfortunately the event ma um, management company kind of fizzled for me mm. and it was a, a big life lesson for me um, when I look back it fizzled because I really wasn't passionate about it. I wasn't enjoying it. I wanted to run a business, but I also wanted to love the business I was running. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why it fizzled. I, it just, I didn't wake up feeling like it was something I enjoyed. Mm. I think that's probably the, the thing that folks find scariest, and I know I've had that trouble as well, when you start thinking about maybe trying to add a freelance um uh, for want of a better word, like, like, yeah, sideline to your current career. And at the back of your mind, there is this thing that says, are you sure you want to start doing something that you uh, give a shit about as much as your current day job? Um, yeah. and, you, and you have all these ideas for things that you could be doing and they might be interesting and whatever. And it all, it seems you almost consciously think, why am I trying to talk myself out of doing something that's going to make me independent and... Uh, yeah, uh, make me a bit more skilled and a bit more successful when the back of your mind is going, this is not what you're looking for. This is not it. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it's one of the most frustrating things I know. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, from the sounds of it, uh, your husband came home with the perfect solution to that little problem. <laughs> it took me a while to listen to him. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, you guys set up Zoo Studio uh, yes. What were what were some of those challenges in the early days of, you know, getting this business off the ground? I mean, it's from the sounds of it, you had, um, from what Ken was saying, you already had some business there. Uh, what was it like actually taking that and turning that into a going concern? Ooh, um, I mean, to start off with, I was on my own. So Beck was um, working with her friend on on another business, and ah. I was doing. Zoo Studio all on my own and I did that for um, from 2007 to 2009 and um, I think my main challenge then was um, I guess loneliness in a way um, I, I was used to working in teams and I love teamwork mm. and um, that had been a big part of my software career and I, I went into management and in, working for the software company and built a team and it was really exciting and I loved it and suddenly I found myself doing something I enjoyed doing but not having anyone to share it with, and um, I found that lonely, if I'm being honest, and that was a major challenge for me. Yeah. Um, but also um, the, the challenge of um, how many balls you've got to keep up in the air when you are running a business and trying to do that on your own, and the very different sorts of disciplines between doing something that's um, innately creative, which is pet portraiture, and things that aren't creative, which is doing the books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I really struggled. <laughs> and uh, I, I, the first thing I did pretty much was find a bookkeeper to help me keep me on the straight and narrow so I could do things like bass statements and um, not get in too much trouble with the ATO. And um, um, I, I guess that was my main challenge, yeah, just loneliness and trying to keep all those balls up in the air, especially the balls that I wasn't naturally um, – so interested in, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Um, I guess at some point um, from 2000... Well, actually, let me stop babbling and tripping over my own words for a sec. So 2009, was that when Beck came on board? And did you... At what point did you also start bringing other people into the team to uh, uh, take some of those uh, other chunks of the responsibility of running a business off you? 
Um, well, in, in 2009, we made a big life decision, which was that we wanted to move from Perth to Brisbane. We'd come out here to Brisbane on a holiday um, with um, uh, some of Beck's relatives from the UK because they wanted to come out and see a rainforest, and uh, we absolutely loved it over here. Yeah. And it was also closer to Beck's family. And so I think it took us about 30 seconds after we got back from holiday to make that decision. And <laughs> we're pretty good at making these big life-changing decisions. <laughs> mm. And uh, we don't kind of sit around and analyse it. It's just if it feels right, yeah, let's do it. And I think literally it was, oh, I quite fancy going to live in Brisbane. So do I. Should we do it? Yeah, okay. And then that was the decision we made and we stuck to it. Yeah. Um, and um, when we moved, so that, that gave Beck a natural break from the business she had been doing. And um, I... And um, uh, as part of the conversation and the planning for coming over here, Beck said, yeah, I'll come and work with you with Zoo Studio. And um, I was really excited because um, uh, having someone else to <laughs> look after the bits I wasn't naturally so good at, especially the, the marketing um, and, the, and the sales aspects, then um, I, I thought, yeah, we can really start getting somewhere now. Mm -hmm. And I was looking to still run a business, but run a business with a product and a service that I really loved and I really believed in. Um, and I've always always I don't have children when I'm in my 40s my fur kids are my kids um, and so it was a great opportunity for me to jump in and really you know take zoo studio to the next level mm. so winding it forward a little bit to now um, yeah. you guys are a successful business you have had people throwing uh, chunks of metal and uh, uh, bits of ribbon and sheets of paper and uh, hunks of wooden perspex at you for the last. <laughs> are you few talking years. about Ken's awards? <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah. I wonder There's what just... you were going on about. I said, no, we're not in construction, Rob. We're... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, just uh, just a holdover from. Um, uh, my old my old days in the the Sydney RPG scene when you uh, told the pe uh, when you called the people who um, got all the awards at the end of the show lumberjacks. So uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but yes, so you are by all accounts uh, a successful business. What is? Uh, can you take me through a little bit of um, the day to day? reality of uh making the awesomeness happen um uh how do you divide up your time between of course getting the lovely photos done and what are some of those skills about actually getting animals to cooperate for those fantastic shots and um managing uh the rest of it the uh, the sales and the marketing in your case beck and uh, uh the rest of the team who handle all those lovely things like uh, accountancy and uh, um the uh, the bits and pieces that uh, you'd you'd rather not deal with. Yeah, photos. Start with the photos. Start That's with a lot photos. of questions. So it is. It's a lot of questions at once, and I'm I'm sorry about that. Is trying to get the <laughs> set out the overall picture of um, awesome. doing the photos versus the business. You know, it's um people. It's kind of like the Tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Yeah, people we, we, tend to, I think they tend to put doing what you love up on a pedestal, that once you're doing yeah. it, it's all sunshine and rainbows. And I guess in your case, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're spending the day with your cameras and the pets and it's all fun and all the yeah. rest of the stuff. It's, it's it, because the main thing is also glorious. It's, yeah, and people tend to forget that even though it's still a business that you love, it is still a business. And I like to give the uh, people an idea That's of what that involves so they can sort of, Take once they've taken it off the pedals, so they can still look at it. Maybe even try those things that doing it really involves every day, and go, well, yeah, okay, yes, this is still for me. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah, good mm. point. Um, well, I, I guess um, uh, the, the the key to it is uh, organisation, which um, is another great reason for having Beck on board because she's way more organised than me. Mm. Um, but there's a lot more to running a photography studio than just taking photos, and. Um, um, I'm photographing three or four days a week, but I make sure that I've got a day where I can look at doing other things because it's important that you're working on the business, not just in the business. And um, so, I mean, uh, like today, I'm not going to be picking up a camera today, but I'm uh, going to be um, planning for my sessions later on in the week predominantly and also um, just looking at the photos that I took last week and making sure they're ready to go to our graphic designer to have a, a, a further look at. Um, and um, yeah, I feel like I'm burbling now, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Look, it's a, you know, photography. The actual photography part um, is probably for in, in in terms of the number of staff we've got. So we've got me, 
We've got <coughs> Jackie full time. We've got John full time. We have another girl called Sarah that works part time. There's me. So there's five of us in the business. And I would say that the actual physical time that we're spending doing the photography is about what 15, 20 percent of the yeah. whole. T- if you include our whole time, it's probably 15, 20 percent um, of the actual business. Um, the big chunk of our time is is really focusing on on delivering customer service. Um, so all the other elements that involve wrap around the photography, um, the digital editing of the photography, the um, the discussion and consultation with the clients in terms of collecting their stories. We're really, you know, photographers should be storytellers, not just taking beautiful photos. Um, I, for us, it's really, really important that we're actually capturing the spirit of, who that fur kid is to our clients um, and getting that story and making, helping the clients feel comfortable telling us those stories because they're often very personal, um, deeply meaningful stories to them that they might not necessarily share and, and getting them to open up and, and tell us those stories so that we can truly capture that in a, in a photograph for them forever um, takes a lot of time and skill set. Um, it's one of my greatest joys, to be honest. Um, in from my side of it, the see, you know, we talk about sales, but to me, sales is just having an open, honest discussion with the client and serving the client. That's what sales is, um, and it's my biggest joy. I do all of the design consultations. So once Ken's done the photos, um, I spend probably. 30, 40% of my time sitting with the clients, um, working through the photos with them, um, discussing the photos with them and designing something beautiful for their wall spaces. And during that time, which is usually about two hours with each client, I'm I'm just having, I, I just get to see and talk and appreciate and share in how much people really love their pets and how much their pets have rescued them. and and how much sometimes their pets mean more to them than anything else in the world. Um, and I get to talk to people that whose dogs are dying of cancer and have been loyal friends with them for 14 years and we shed a tear together. And I, I get to share in the joy of, of a new puppy that's just come into the household. Um, I get to share in the joy of a woman that's, you know, recently been divorced and her dog is her saviour. Like, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing and that's my greatest joy and my greatest passion. Mm. Um, so I probably spend about that, you know, 20, 30 percent of my time and the rest of it is admin and finance and managing staff and everything else that a norm, any small business, no matter what product that you're doing, um, is involved with. Yeah. Um, and so re- and planning and strategy and, and building your marketing plan and your 12 month content management calendar, all that kind of stuff mm. is, is my day to day stuff as well. I guess it's um, you know that you're on the right thing when it's that. 20% that is making uh, all that 80% worthwhile so that you don't even yeah. question, you're not even yeah. questioning the fact that you have to do all that other 80%. It's just, it's it's what you're doing. And yes, yeah. correct. Mm. It's, it's, we're doing it to get more clients so we can ke- share more stories and get that love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I'm suddenly, for some odd reason, I'm thinking of uh, Kodak, the photo Kodak? company. Yeah. Who uh, basically, if you said that to anyone, I think under uh, it used to be a huge brand name. Of course, as you guys would know, but if you said that name to under anyone now. under twenty nowadays, they would give you a blank look because Absolutely. they um, they forgot that they they thought they were in the business of selling uh, cameras and film, and they forgot that they were in the business of helping helping people tell stories, and uh, that's yeah. why they basically lost out to the uh, the digital revolution and. Um, it is uh it's it's good again to hear another example with you guys of that you you know you are pet photography that's what that's how you would describe the business but that's it is really about helping other people tell their stories yeah absolutely yeah. in the business of creating happiness around that yeah that uh, uh i think if anyone's looking for an idea of whether or not they found their their direction in life that's pretty much what they need to do what do you what how are you helping other people uh create happiness in their lives absolutely yeah. absolutely so um 
uh, even though you are doing uh, the both of you a job that you thoroughly enjoy, uh, are there any particular um, uh, down or negative periods that you kind of just – any punches that when it comes to down to it you just have to roll with that are uh, part of the life of doing business? <laughs> yeah, the bass statement, Rob. Oh. <laughs> I have I have yet to deal with that myself, although I know it looms in my future as I as I start slowly building. But yeah, I, I warn the staff. I turn into a grumble back every, once, a quarter, <laughs> once a quarter, where I have to. Yeah. I kind of like to, you know, we should outsource it, and we have outsourced it many times in the past. And and this is what small business owners, you know, need to make decisions on all the time. When do you outsource, or do you outsource? Do you employ full time? And there are plenty of opportunities throughout the business um, and the years we've been doing this to, to look at that. And I've outsourced it and I haven't outsourced it. Now, I've brought that back into the fold because for me, it's a, um, a good, um, I guess, process or um, to do thing that I like to do in order to get a real head around the figures. Mm. Um, so I do all the finance and the bookkeeping at the moment. Um, as much as I don't like it, all I do like doing is forcing myself to get my head more clearly around the figures for the month, for the quarter, for the half year, and that, et cetera, et cetera. So I sort of block out time in my diary to make sure that that does happen because it's something I don't like doing. Yeah. I block time out it's to make, my, my, make myself do it. So. Mm. I think any small business owner needs to own the figures of the business and have a clear understanding of those figures moving forward. Now, just to clarify something very quickly uh, Mm. for those overseas listeners and probably those Australian listeners who aren't 100% familiar with uh, business and taxation, what is a BAS? Business activity statement. <laughs> once you start earning, <laughs> once you start earning over fifty thousand dollars a year, the Australian tax office makes you do a business activity statement once a quarter, um, which basically is basically taking calculation of um, the GST, the goods and services tax, or in case of the UK, VAT, um, and you have to calculate what you can claim and what you actually have to pay out. So. Mm. And is that um, is that fifty thousand dollars a year uh, in profit or total income? I think it's. T- I'm not a tax expert, <laughs> but it's, I'm pretty sure it's total income. So yeah, um, you can be GST free um, under fifty thousand dollars, and then once you're over fifty thousand dollars, you need to register for GST. I don't know whether you have to do a quarterly BAS. We're certainly doing a lot more than fifty thousand mm. dollars. Um, so you know we have to do a quarterly bath and and, and monthly um, uh, wage tax a payg as well. Mm. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, there are some fantastic sides of uh, doing this business. Uh, oh, yes. uh, I tell you what, could you maybe tell me uh, a couple of one or two recent stories about some uh, folks who uh, you've worked with and um, uh, some pets who you have helped uh, bring out their, uh, although obvious fabulousness, it's sometimes hard, hard to capture in a, a single two-dimensional slice of a moment. So uh, how, did you, um, how did you guys do that for your clients? <laughs> oh, there's so many. What yeah, about, just, um, well, Emma. I hate I hate to ask you guys oh. to play favourites, and uh, <laughs> but so many. sometimes you just last yeah. Week, <laughs> last week, one for me. Look, there's, there's there's some beautiful moments of of older dogs and 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 beautiful dogs, but the one that sticks out from in my memory is actually was only last week, and I, I um it was a returning client, um, Emma. And she had got a new baby in her family. She'd been to us a couple of times before with her beautiful Great Dane charge. And she had been wanting a French bulldog for a long, long time. And um, I actually referred her to one of our clients and recommended her to one of our clients who bred French bulldogs. Um, And this beautiful French bulldog came into her life and we did a photo shoot last week. And what stuck out for me was she found out before she'd taken the French Bulldog that um, this little French Bulldog had been born with a heart murmur and didn't have very long to live. Um, And he had only about a year, between a year and five years to live. And one day his heart would just give up and he'd Uh. fall. He would die in his sleep. And, you know, ordinarily in an ordinary world, 
uh, she didn't have to take on this French bulldog, and her obligations is every three months she has to go to the vets for a for a heart checkup with this little French bulldog mm. called Chase. And the breeder was absolutely horrified as well. And she chose to to take him on because she wanted to give because she's a wonderful mum and she wanted to give him the best possible one to five years he'd ever have. And yeah. It's just beautiful. Like I, I like so we got some beautiful photos of him wrapped in a in a blanket. Um him chewing her shoelaces, um, him you know, in scales because he was he's only a tiny little dog. So because of his sickness, so he's only four kilos. So we we did a scale shot with him sitting on the scale, showing four kilos. Um, and I actually worked in the photo shoot with Ken with um, with her for that one as well. And um, I think what she's doing and how much love I don't, I don't is, wouldn't it be horrible knowing that your puppy dog or your child has only got, you know, just suddenly going to just die. And there was nothing, nothing that the veterinary practice could do for him. Mm. Absolutely nothing. No medication, no operation, no nothing. Um, but she was going to give him 150% of her love for the time he had. And yeah. I just think it's beautiful. It is. Um, it's the sort of thing that you almost wish uh, more people in this world would do for uh, yeah. for everybody. Yeah, rather not than, many people would yeah. do that. Mm. <laughs> so. I thought it was lovely, and we we captured the essence of him being a baby because he, he is a baby. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you guys, of course, have a successful business. Tell me, what are some of the things that you uh, are perhaps looking forward to on the horizon? Maybe things that um, you have heard about or are curious about and just haven't yet had the chance to try. Wow, there's lots. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think some of it we're still working on. So, um, but in, we're looking more at the, the publishing side of the business as well. So, in terms of books um, and sharing our photographic stories to a broader audience, that's mm. one thing that we're looking at. Um, we're also looking at the um, actual the photos that we're taking ourselves and how we can pour more, even more storytelling into our photographs. So taking it up a notch in terms of um, photographic technology and photographic storytelling are probably the two key focuses. Um, and also getting a bit smarter on the marketing side. So content marketing, stuff like what you do, Rob, with podcasts, mm. um, content marketing, um, building your list in terms of your email list, um, those kind of investments in the marketing side is another area that we're focused on as well. So yeah. we meet every quarter. We have a two two day offsite with the team once a year where we plan our strategies for the year, uh, and then we break down that strategy into a quarterly half day, which then gets broken down into a, a monthly catch up and then a weekly catch up. So we're pretty driven by our strategies and our goals. And again, we've I guess we've systemized that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important. I think it's important. Mm. You have to have uh, goals and, and have a direction of where, you, where you're trying to see the ship as well. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think it does. And I think it's even answered one of the, uh, the next question in part that I was about to ask, which is the dreaded three things question. What three <laughs> pieces of advice would you give someone, whether they're looking to maybe get into uh, photography or any other passion project that they have and wanting to get paid to play for it, that maybe perhaps you uh, wish that someone had told you guys when you were getting started? Oh, that's really great. I'm going to answer that. Kim might want to interject as well. But um, I think for me, the first thing was um, go with your gut sooner. <laughs> hmm. um, there are things that we did in our business that we faffed around, you know, faffed around with. One of them, I'm going to give you a classic example. Um, would you, have, you might have even seen them. Have you ever seen the, the dogs underwater shots that have roved around the internet, Rob? Um, I think I've seen a couple, yes. Yes, yeah, you would have, wouldn't you? Mm, yes, because yeah. they were viral. They went viral yes, two that's or three right. years ago. They did and, too, I um, remember now. Mm. And Ken and I have been faffing around <laughs> with getting a kit list together and doing that ourselves in our own pool 
you know, six months before those photos started floating around the internet. Yeah. Um, and we just faffed around. We didn't. We thought it would be a great idea, and we, we knew in our gut it was, but we faffed around, and we missed the boat in terms of being able to deliver something ahead of someone that already went viral and did very successfully with a whole bunch of books. So, yeah. go with your gut sooner is a lesson that I'm starting to learn, uh, listen to more and more. Mm. Um, the other one was get a business coach straight away. Um, we did get a business coach for the business um, and Ken's had various mentors through his life. Um, I wish we'd done it sooner. We didn't bring in our business coach until oh, late 2010. Um, he was a, a specialist in our particular industry um, and I think if we had brought him in sooner, we would be in a slightly different place today. Um, and the third thing for me, which is probably my most important is we're so passionate about what we're doing. We're so driven to build a successful business. We're so driven to over-service our clients that sometimes we forget about ourselves. Mm. Um, and we're in a creative industry and we it is our responsibility to remain creative and fresh for our clients. And we, we got to a point where we were working six days a week, 13, 14 hours a day, I was doing a lot of evening work because I was doing the design consults in the evenings after the clients had finished their job. And it's it's very easy to get tired. Anyone can get tired no matter how much they love their business. Um, so this year in particular and last year, we've learnt to take more breaks out of the business um, in order to re remain fresh and have time to think about what we're wanting to do and what we're wanting to achieve next. So taking breaks out of the business is really important and not feeling guilty about it. That's mm. the thing I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, assuming that having me having dropped your main website address at the beginning of the episode hasn't basically caused most of our listeners already to uh, be, have hit your website and uh, been looking at all your glorious photos while uh, this chat has been going on and they've not been going, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to tell all my friends about this and Facebooking and Twitterizing <laughs> and sharing frantically. Where can people uh, find you online and how can they get in touch with you after uh, after hearing this episode? Well, the best thing is, that the, uh, is to go to our website, www.zoostudio.com.au forward slash contact. Um, there's an online form there. There's also um, a whole bunch of phone numbers that they can use. We, we really encourage people to actually pick up the phone and call me old-fashioned. <laughs> but we like to have conversations with our clients and make sure that we can service them and their needs specifically. So um, the, num uh, the number, <laughs> what's our number? Oh, oh, 07 <laughs> 3870 -0903. 07-3870-0903. Um, is the best is the best contact, or the email address is info i n f o at zoostudio dot com dot au. They're the best ways to get in touch with us, and check us out on Facebook as well, which is facebook uh, facebook dot com forward slash zoostudio photography. Mm -hmm. And don't put an S in that, folks. It is studio no. singular <laughs> right the way through. I know a lot of folks like to say studios plural just to make themselves sound like a, a bigger deal but uh, uh, these folks they don't need they don't need to worry about that they don't need to make big claims they know how good they are um, to, to, to borrow Chris, from Christopher Rickleston's Doctor Who I had to do something geeky in there at some point anyway <laughs> Beck and Ken Drake of Zoo Studio it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you guys about what you love to do for this episode of the podcast thank you once again for your time Thank you. Thanks, Rob. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure.